This webinar is one of the initiatives that we have organized for the members of the LEM Working Group. Um, NEMO, uh, as network of European organizations, is organized in working groups, one of which is called the LEM, the Learning Museum. And this uh, working group started in 2014, just at the end uh, of a European funded project, which was called with the same name, uh, the LEM, the, the, the Learning Museum, uh, which was a network project, um, which brought together a huge number of uh, museum organizations and, and other organizations working with museums to achieve um, a better understanding of learning and to transform museums into learning environments and learning organizations themselves. Um, the projects, as you know, all European projects come to an end. That happened also to that project, which I, which my organization, the Institute of Cultural Heritage, was project coordinator of and which I led. And when you come at the end of a European project, there's always the dilemma, what's going to happen with the materials, with the relations, with the productions, with the outcomes and so on. So the, the idea then was to incorporate uh, the LEM working group, which, which was, as I said, a network itself into NEMO. So uh, the material was transferred into uh, the NEMO's repositories and the members of the LEM working group also became some of them members of NEMO. In any case, a group was retained, which continues to exist nowadays, which is called LEM, uh, the working group LEM. And in this working group, which I uh, coordinate, uh, normally, uh, in normal conditions, uh, we, we uh, organize a, a, a study visit once a year, and, and we uh, commission um, a research once a year. And then, of course, we meet uh, when, when the network comes together uh, during the annual conference. Of course, uh, this year and last year, uh, we were not able to meet in person and to organize a study visit. So um, we decided to um, organize uh, other kind of get togethers like this webinar. So as I said, the webinar is open to only members of the LEM working group were invited to join it, although the registration the recording will be um, available to everyone afterwards on the NEMO's website. But we also invited, because they showed an interest, uh, members of another European funded project, which is Charter. Charter is a very important project that we as museum people and cultural heritage people should all be aware of. This is the project in the, uh, in the arena um, for these four years. Uh, and in order to introduce you, because uh, I think that the meeting of the two groups is, could also be very, uh, very advantageous for both. I, I invited uh, one of its coordinators um, to briefly present to the um, LEM people what the charter project is. And so I asked the Herman Mendolicchio uh, to, to do that as representative of the University of Barcelona, which is leading the project. So Herman, thank you. And thanks to the members of Charter for taking part. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Margarita. And thanks to Nimo uh, for the invitation to present the Charter project and in this very interesting session. So I will uh, quickly share the screen. Let me check if it's working. Yes, can you see it? Good. So here we go. So as agreed, that will be very brief uh, and that will quickly introduce uh, what is Charter, what is its uh, main mission and uh, who are the partners that compose the, the consortium. So first of all, Charter, as Margarita was saying, is an Erasmus Plus funded project that started recently in January 2021 and it will be developed during the next four years until December 2024. The acronym of the project, Charter, stands for Cultural Heritage Actions to Refine Training, Education and Roles. And um, its mission and main goals are to sustainably protect, promote and enhance European tangible and intangible cultural heritage by creating a lasting and comprehensive sectoral skills strategy bridging the gaps between educational and occupational systems and employer needs and propose training and curricula for the development of new skills for cultural heritage professionals. 
including those working in museums, as Margarita said, for the museum sector is also a very important project. So um, what is important to highlight is that Charter is an alliance, hmm? is an alliance among key stakeholders, uh, and it will involve and analyze the needs and expectations of at least these four main sectors. On one side, the education and training providers that seek to improve clarity on curricula provision. On the other side, the industry that wish to be certain of the availability of high quality expertise. Then on another side, the public bodies and agencies that need to articulate policies uh, that safeguard, sustain, and promote cultural heritage. And finally, the important and wide sector of the cultural heritage professionals mm, that seek rec recognition for their roles and mission. So who composes the, uh, the consortium? Mm? Charter is composed by 47 members. So it's a huge, it's a very huge consortium representing a wide spectrum of the cultural heritage field. I cannot uh, name now all of them uh, for sake of time, uh, but we have 21 full members representing 14 uh, EU states. And among them, we have universities, education and training organizations, we have employers, uh, we have European networks. Then we have seven affiliated members uh, representing also different regions in Europe and we have 19 associated members. So the goals of the project are many and the Charter Consortium is working on identifying the multiple challenges that the cultural heritage sector is facing, both in the professional field and the educational field. So what I would invite you to do is in order to get more information is to check the website that is uh, now available online. And I would invite you as well to subscribe to the newsletter to keep updated on the events and the results of the project. And you have here, it's small, but you have the website here, charter-alliance.eu. So thank you very much, Margarita. And that's it. Thank you, Herman. And of course, you can keep uh, in the loop uh, with regard to the charter project because NEMO is also a member. So also through the, through the NEMO website, you will find the updates and the link, etc. It is a very important project because it deals with skills and professions and profiles. And, and as we know, people are important in museums, not only as visitors, as public audience, but also the people working in museums are very important. Uh, museum is a, is a labor intensive organization. So, you know, people really make a difference. So I can also bringing these two groups together this afternoon, I thought that we could maybe envisage a cooperation in the future because when it comes for the charter project to look into the profession of the museum educator, say, uh, I think that a, a very fruitful exchange could happen uh, with the with the members of the LEM working group. So um, having said that, uh, I mentioned that uh, the, the working group uh, commissions uh, uh, a report or is a research uh, once a year, and you will find them all uh, again on the NEMO website, uh, the, the previous one, not the 2021, but not the 2021, but the previous one, 2019, was called with a provocative title, is learning better without objects. So some of them are quite uh, uh, interesting and challenging, and I invite you to, to have a look. But this year or last year, the one that was published in 2021, but was carried out in 2020, is about museums and emotions, emotions and learning in museums. And it was edited by Paolo Mazzanti of the University of Florence. So I give him the floor to briefly tell us a few words about the publication. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Just a moment. Can you see? Yeah, okay. Good afternoon, good morning to everybody and thank you Margarita for inviting me and uh, Nemo uh, for inviting me to introduce the report. 
Uh, I'm Paolo Mazzanti, working at uh, the University of Florence uh, in a Media Integration and Communication Center and NIMEC. This is another competence center of the University of Florence. They are two interdisciplinary uh, research center uh, focused on multimedia technologies for museums, for cultural heritage sectors, but also other sectors. And my research is focused, uh, focused on on user experience and uh, interaction design. So Margarita introduced the, the report and uh, the report was published the last February. And uh, it's important to say that uh, the, the report uh, explored the role that emotions uh, play in uh, supporting uh, the learning in museum experience, uh, how emotions are preconditioned for learning uh, during the visitor uh, journey and uh, inside the museum uh, during, after, and uh, before. The idea from the report uh, came from two initiatives. One is uh, Musei Motivi in Italian and in English, the Emotional uh, Museums. So this is uh, a training workshop organized uh, by MIC, by NEMEC, and I am a scientific co-coordinator. Uh, since 2016, we organized five editions in Italian museums. And uh, the topic was uh, the role of uh, uh, emotions in uh, 21 museum uh, designs. So you can see in the slide. And the other initiative was a Connected Audience uh, uh, Conference titled The Role of Emotions in Audience Engagement. I participated together with Margarita in uh, uh, 2019 in Berlin. And uh, the, the conference was organized by Culture Agenda and the Institute for Learning and Innovations and uh, in collaboration with Mimo. And there uh, we meet uh, also uh, Carlene Gardner. She was uh, uh, a speaker of the conference. Um, as you can see in the slide, the, the, the mood, uh, the, the method uh, of Museum Museum TV is an interdisciplinary way to uh, design the museum experience, uh, considering emotions from four main points of view. Uh, from uh, the, the what uh, is uh, the, the content side, considering also emotion from the how, from the exit side, from the with the tools uh, and the technology side, and from the people side. And of course, the, the, the method is connected and involves many studies and many uh, professionals, as you can uh, see in the slide. Uh, why uh, emotion in museums? So why together with Margarita decided to publish this report? You can, of course, uh, uh, understand better and more uh, reading the, the report, but uh, I uh, identify two, uh, two items. One, uh, because emotions are a new trend in many research studies related to human knowledge and uh, human behavior, especially the recent neuroscience uh, uh, confirms that uh, without emotion, we are not able to, uh, to make a decision because uh, emotion pervade our actions, motivate our choices, make our experience more memorable. And uh, there is a new idea of a museum, uh, museum people-centered. Uh, museums need to consider emotion to stay relevant because uh, museum not of the present and maybe museum of the future are not only exhibition spaces, but also dynamic places for uh, research, for learning, uh, for improving well-being uh, and sharing ideas and socializing. So uh, emotion uh, is used to motivate access to the research contents, uh, to stimulate the curiosity, attention and the interest of the public. Also, the report, uh, uh, also the, the selected authors of the report analyzed the relationship between learning and emotions in, uh, in museums from a different perspective in an interdisciplinary way. We analyzed uh, the, the role of the motion inside and outside museums, the role of the motion uh, from the digital technology uh, point of view, from the, the, ro the role of the motion from the 
oceanography point of view, uh, the relationship between emotional networks and communities and stories and storytellings, uh, connecting with audiences, uh, the role of the emotions uh, in museum going to decide to visit uh, the museums and the planning the museum experience, the role of the emotions and the relationship uh, in uh, the history, and of course the empathy, uh, the 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 to be effective uh, and emotional museum also be connected with audiences. And uh, you, as you can see here in the table of contents, there is also a contribution uh, written by Caroline Gardner uh, titled Fostering Empathy to the Visual Arts. And she outlines how art um, expand our perceptions uh, and trigger triggering, triggers emotional responses and, uh, and empathy. Uh, this is a short uh, overview. You can, of course, uh, download uh, the, the report from the NEMO website and maybe uh, Elizabeth uh, can share the link uh, in, in, in the chat. Mm, the idea of the, the webinars uh, maybe uh, was inspired by also the report and by the, the contribution of uh, Kathleen. It's just ours. Uh, I give uh, the floor to Marguerite and thank you again. Thank you, Paolo. Indeed, uh, the report is made up uh, by contributions both of uh, people who intervened at the Musei Emotivi workshops and uh, by uh, presenters at the conference in Berlin that, that Paolo mentioned. It's this combination. And so in order to look more into this topic of empathy in museums, which I first encountered by reading the day Trends Watch publication 2017 of the Center for the Future in Museums, which uh, challenged museums to contribute to filling the empathy gap in American society or in society in general. Um, I, I, I thought we thought that it would be nice to have someone looking into this from a very practical point of view, a pr practitioner's point of view. So we did ask uh, Carlene Garner to uh, present this afternoon and uh, she came all the way from Minneapolis. Thank you for joining us. Uh, where she is uh, Director of Learning and Innovation at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. And she leads also the Center for Empathy and the Visual Arts. And previously she served as Curator of Education at the Memphis Brooks Museum of Art and on the board of the Museum Education Roundtable. So thank you so much for joining us, Carlene, and now the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, let's see. Get the slide. There we go. Okay. Um, well, good afternoon, and I guess good morning here. Um, I'm glad to be with you all today. Thanks for being here. I wanted to start out today um, with this quote by um, a really well known um, artist. And um, it says, What I love in art is that it takes down known combinations and reorders them in a way that sheds light on something that we have never seen before or allows us to consider the world in a slightly different way. And I think this quote by Kehinde Wiley really helps us think about the impact uh, that we can have um, in our work in museums and really um, how working, um, engaging with objects, whether it's art, historical objects, scientific objects, really can help us think about things in different ways and maybe help us see things from someone else's perspective. So, there we go. sorry, there we go. And so really in thinking about empathy and museums, whether uh, art museums or any other kind of museums, I like to think about, um, what are people expecting? How can we model empathy as cultural institutions by meeting the needs and expectations of people? And this was a um, culture track is a survey that's done by an American um, organization here called La Placa Cohen. And they do uh, a survey every three years to see people's motivations and to um, kind of gauge their experiences with cultural institutions. And this was a survey uh, they recently did um, last spring um, 
with uh, COVID and really asking people, you know, what are you looking for when you can actually return to cultural institutions? So you can see um, a variety uh, of things people are looking for, but particularly looking at art museums, um, I think people are looking for escape now. So 57% of people are, really wanna see something beautiful and inspirational. 49% of people are looking to be challenged or for their thinking to be changed, um, much like the quote from Kahindi Wiley indicated. And then kind of to um, Paolo's point, they're looking to be engaged emotionally. They're looking for emotionally powerful experiences. And we know when people's motivations are engaged and activated, they have more profound experiences, they have more uh, learning and they have more memorable experiences. Um, and as Margarita mentioned, um, there is an empathy deficit in the United States, and I would probably say um, across the world. This is an older study. I think there it's being uh, redone right now, but it shows um, a decline in empathetic concern and perspective taking. This is particularly for college age students in the United States from 1979 to 2009. And there are many theories of why this um, is happening. Um, we can think about social media, people usually talk, you know, communicating with devices rather than face-to-face. -face. People aren't in participating in um, activities as groups as much. Religious uh, participation has gone down. People aren't getting out into nature as much. So there's a lot of things contributing to this. But um, as a museum, we really thought about how can we think about using our collection and our programs and teaching strategies to really help, you know, with the empathy deficit and foster empathy amongst our audiences. And then also really create tools and strategies that we can share with the field. Um, so when I really started looking into empathy research with the visual arts, the really none exists. So this was a real impetus for us to think about um, what we could do with our collection. Um, and so I wanted to first start off with, there's so many different definitions of empathy that even social scientists, neuroscientists, nobody can agree on one definition. The definition we're using at MIA, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, is this one by um, Roman Kuznarek, who is, um, he's a British philosopher, he's an empathy scholar and author, and he also founded the Empathy Museum, which you can see pictured here. And he created an experience where you go in and get sized for shoes. Um, and you put literally put someone else's shoes on and listen to an audio tour in their own voice, hear their story, and you literally walk a mile in their shoes. And um, it, I've done this um, experience at the Empathy Museum. It was really amazing. And I love his definition. It's the ability to step into the shoes of another person, aiming to understand their feelings and perspectives, and to use that understanding to guide our actions. So I think um, empathy is very important, but empathy is not enough. So it's really putting that empathy into action. So that's what I really appreciate about um, his definition is that it's focused on action. Um, it doesn't just stay in our heads. It really impacts the way we act and treat people in our everyday lives. So again, I was, what, what can we do with our collection? At the Minneapolis Institute of Art, we have over 92,000 objects spanning 5,000 years. So we feel like we have this amazing opportunity to engage people with cultures and time periods and people they um, can never experience in their lives and um, really connect people with the people they're visiting the museum with, with artists, with different ways of thinking. So in 2017, we founded um, the Center for Empathy and the Visual Arts, which is our museum. So it's, we're taking a really institutional approach to empathy. We're thinking about it from the visitor experience, the way we're marketing, the way we're doing programs. It's really permeating everything we do as a museum. Oops, sorry. Um, and one of, I was gonna kind of just talk about the three areas for the Center and for Empathy and the Visual Arts. One is building communities of practice. And it's kind of getting out of our museum bubble 
and bringing in people with different expertise, different lived experiences, and helping us build something together. So one of the things about empathy is really the valuing multiple perspectives and viewpoints. And we're really trying to model this in our practice um, with the Center for Empathy and the Visual Arts. So you can see we're partnering with a lot of academic institutions. You can see one of the first things first things that we did with the center was convene a think tank um, at the University of California, Berkeley with a wide variety of people from different backgrounds. And then in 2019, we hosted Empathy Lab at MIA where we invited people from all across the country, very different expertise, skill sets, disciplines, and they came and spent time in our galleries with our staff. So it was curators, educators, media producers, um, and really thinking about empathy and how we can foster empathy with our collections, with the way we interpret exhibitions, how we produce content. So that's one of the areas that we are um, really focused on are these communities of practice. And then we are also thinking very much about our programs. So how can we invite different people into the museum to share their stories, to crea create art inspired by our collection and to share those stories with our public. So here you can see a partnership we did with the Advocates for Human Rights by inviting spoken word artists in um, who created uh, spoken word pieces inspired by artworks from our collection. And then really recently with COVID, we've exper been experimenting with virtual programs. So a few weeks ago, we hosted um, a virtual empathy lab, um, was really about setting the conditions. And it was um, interactive and very experimental for us. And um, <clears throat> we did a lot of learning and we really realized, I'm sure like many of you have, because we're having to work in a virtual world right now, we can reach people across the world across the country, much like we're doing in this program right now. Um, and so we're really thinking about how we can continue experimenting with both in the virtual and in person programming to inspire empathy, empathy to bring in multiple voices and viewpoints and really challenge people to maybe think and act differently. We're also, um, as I mentioned before, um, <clears throat> doing um, several research initiatives. I'm gonna share with you um, in just a few minutes, kind of walk you through our empathy tour. Um, but these are the questions that are really guiding our research. How does engaging with art foster empathy in individuals? And how does that experience that people have at a museum connect them with something bigger than themselves and influence how they think about with how they're thinking and really how they act. Again, not just keeping it in the museum, but how can this impact people's lives and, their, and, and how they engage with others. So we are um, really looking at exhibitions too, thinking about how we work with our curators and designers um, for interpreting for empathy. This is just a kind of a case study I wanted to briefly share with you. Um, it's some exhibition research that we did on an exhibition, When Home Won't Let You Stay, Art and migration. So it was about contemporary art, um, really created within the last 10 years, and um, really looking at the global uh, migration, immigration um, crisis. And it was, uh, this exhibition was developed by the Institute for Contemporary Art in Boston. And what we felt was really missing in um, the in Minneapolis was we have a very large population of people who um, have immigrated to here from all over the world. And we wanted to make local connections, really to humanize and make it a local as well as a global exhibition. So we worked with many different community partners and developed both audio tours as well as labels by um, our community partners who are refugees or immigrants into the Twin Cities, to Minneapolis. And um, so you can see here, Alfreda Daniels, people could listen to her response to um, this artwork and then um, read her, her um, quote on the wall along with the artist label. So we're really experimenting with humanizing, bringing real human and human elements, whether it's through audio or video into our exhibition spaces. And as you can see here, the exhibition, we asked people in a, a survey, um, what emotions are you feeling? This was right after they had visited the exhibition. And you can see a, a wide variety of emotions here. You can see empathy, 
um, was the most predominant one, but you can see sadness, anger, guilt, hope. Um, it was a really tough exhibition. Um, so you can see that happiness was not um, hugely felt. Um, and then kind of digging a little bit deeper, we looked at the emotions, but we're also very interested in perspective taking in terms of empathy. So we asked um, people if they took a perspective other than their own, this was the survey questions we asked them and they reflected on their own relationship with um, immigration and migration. They took a perspective other than their own. Um, again, that emotional connection response. And then they felt compassion, warmth or concern for another person or other people. So really showing the potential um, in kind of unfacilitated experiences that you don't have a guide, but how can we create interpretive materials within exhibitions that will help people have more emotion, emotional responses, more connection to humanity, and to take, you know, really think about different perspectives and viewpoints. And then uh, now I was gonna, I'm going to kind of switch gears a little bit and then focus on the tours we're doing around empathy. And I will start off by saying that we were all poised to do our empathy research on our tours a year ago and COVID happened. So we're going to be picking that up uh, next fall and next spring. So, but we developed a tour, an empathy tour. And these are the key elements. We've been really working with school systems. We've been working with social scientists, with a lot of different people to help us figure out what are the, how can we really be intentional when we're guiding people on an experience through our museums? So the first thing is grounding. So we have an amazing collection of Asian art at our museum. So oftentimes we start off the experience um, in front of a Buddha or a Bodhisattva and ask people just to breathe, to take a few minutes, kind of transition from their daily lives, let all that kind of go and to really be present because uh, part of really practicing empathy is being present. So we start off with some kind of grounding. It might not be with a Buddha, it might just be a breathing exercise, but it's really important. Um, and then we ask the group um, about meeting agreements because we want people to feel, we wanna create a safe space. So um, these are the meeting agreements we share with people. Take space, like speak up, but then step back and let someone else speak. Uh, listen attentively. And uh, remember, this is all very dialogical uh, based teaching. So telling people that you're in charge of your own story, don't share something that you're not comfortable sharing with. And then we ask the audience what else they'd like to see um, on this list that um, they think would create a safe and open environment where people can be vulnerable and share. And then uh, we really do an emotions check-in, whether we're using a piece of artwork, um, like the, the Kusama you can see here on your left, or even like letting people look at a, you know, a page of emojis and point out how they're feeling. Because part of empathy is really being self-aware and knowing what mindset or feelings or emotions you're bringing to a situation and then becoming aware of other people's. So we feel like this exercise is a great way to get everybody you know, together, see where everybody's coming from, how they're feeling, and we have, you know, build on that shared experience. Um, and now I'm going to ask you to engage in an activity. Um, I'm going to ask you and to look at um, these eight portraits um, from our collection and on loan in our collection and take a few minutes um, to find someone that you don't connect with, that you have a hard time connecting with. And really spend a few moments looking at that person and, and try to kind of understand maybe why you're having trouble connecting with them. So just take a couple of minutes and then I'd love for people to, to share out if you're comfortable doing that.
So for the take, sake of time, I'll just, I'll interrupt you all now to, um, did that, do you need more time? I would give you more time obviously in, in the galleries, um, but um, does anybody um, feel free um, to share maybe identifying someone that they didn't connect with and maybe why? I go first. Two okay, people, good. two people, uh -huh. number one and number three. Okay. Number, number one, I, I, I don't know if you say scruffy. Yeah, yes, that's a good, guy good is, adjective, yes. All right, so I don't like that kind of feeling, that kind of noise. Okay. But in contrast, also number three uh, is someone I, because that is the image of myself that I don't want to see, <laughs> that I wouldn't <laughs> want to see. So what about that image? <laughs> makes you, I mean, like, what about that image makes you not want to be that person? Number three or number yeah. one? Number three. Number three. Mm -hmm. Because I think I would be inclined to be that kind of person, you know, very rigorous, very, uh, as opposed to the other guy, mm -hmm. just they, they, these are the opposites, maybe. Uh, right. So maybe I just want to be in between. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's just, I'm just expressing a wish, maybe. Right. That that is not. It's not. I don't feel comfortable with number three because she's too. Uh, um, I don't know how to how to express it in English, but she's too stuck up. Right. Okay. So she's. Yeah, so you're really noticing her body language, her facial expression, and she's kind of giving you an attitude that you really you don't appreciate, and and you don't want to see yourself doing that. Exactly. Yeah. Anybody else want to share? Uh, for me, it's uh, it's the same picture, the number three, because mm -hmm. uh, for me it's difficult. I, I, this is I I I, I am, maybe I, I can understand the, the 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 face expression, and maybe she's not so happy, and uh, and maybe she seems like a teacher or like a psychological and uh, like analyst. So this is not. Uh, not easy create empathy with this position, the sofa, the the position of the the arms. Uh, so um, I identify uh, these uh, because I can recognize something about uh, she, about uh, yeah. her in the in the picture. So again, just I think much like Margarita, you're you're feeling um, that kind of a like she's kind of there's a barrier. Um, she's kind of got authoritarian um, feeling to her that is not very conducive to empathy or warmth. Maybe one more can, person and then... Can I, sure. can I add? Uh, I, um, Absolutely. I also, I also, the least person I would engage with would be three. And just for the sake of, it looks like the kind of person that if you smile, you know, when you get to somebody and you smile, it's like, and the, hey, how are you? And then the other person smiles and, and everything starts. Here it wouldn't happen. <laughs> That's the feeling is there's no there's no dialogue there. So I better just okay. move on. <laughs> so there's just no there's no yeah dialogue or two there's ways. No room for kind a of her way or no way. Yeah, there's no, exactly. no room for your opinions or thoughts. Okay. Mm. Okay. Well, I wish I could spend time with everybody, but we're gonna just for the sake of time, I'm gonna move on. But this is um, an example of um, something that was um, really thinking about there's a lot of research that we show that shows we empathize with people who are like us who have the same backgrounds who might look like us and we have a harder time empathizing with people that we feel are different or um you know not warm so um we think this is a really good exercise and, and if we were in the galleries i'd ask you all to spend several minutes with that person and see if your uh, perceptions might have cha might change by spending some time getting curious. Um, so, I was let me see. All right. So these are the questions. So we can also you can also start off asking someone who they do connect with and why. Then you could you know have somebody that you don't connect with and why, and then spend time and really kind of unpack why you don't connect with them or why you do and really kind of building that self-awareness within yourself. 
This exercise also is a really good way. We, we're really thinking about something that's kind of new for us on our tours. Usually we have a tour guide that takes you to every, the different artworks and you, and you don't have any choice or agency in what you're looking at or discussing. So in our empathy tours, we're giving people agency in galleries to, to walk around, find an artwork that resonates with them, or in this case, doesn't. So agency and giving people choice has been really important on our empathy tours. Um, we're also thinking a lot about, you know, get stepping into someone else's shoes. So with younger children, we're thinking about embodiment and tableau. So I'm sure a lot of you have asked young people or adults to strike a pose and think about how the, the, you know, the sculpture, the person in the painting is feeling at that moment. So really trying to step into someone's um, body, if you will, and trying to understand their emotions at that moment and share those back. So this is something we do with younger children. Um, and then with um, older children and adults, we do step more into perspective taking. Um, and so I'm gonna, um, this is a routine that was developed by Harvard's Project Zero. It's a global thinking routine. And it really challenges you to um, step in to the painting and identify a person that you want to spend some time with and really think about. And then challenge yourself, you know, from what you can see at this time, what do you think this person is feeling, what are you thinking? What do you think they're thinking? Um, what, can, what do you know about them just from looking at them? And then um, you want to, people to step out and really think about how hard it is and challenging to, um, to really know someone from just looking at them. So you often need a lot more information, but what might you need to know that might help you understand that person better. And then kind of, you know, think about that. Um, I think this is oftentimes we make snap judgments and don't really think about things or try to learn more about another person. So perspective taking in this exercise really challenges us to, to think more deeply, to find out more, to be curious, and then really stepping back um, from the artwork and saying, given your exploration of this person so far, what have you noticed about yourself? How hard it is, is it to take someone else's perspective? Because you can only go so far. We can't truly understand the perspective of another person, especially if we have not lived, you know, had their cultural experiences, their life experiences. But it's very important for us to attempt to take perspectives and to have better understanding of people by doing that and really trying not to make snap judgments. Um, so that was, and then finally, really importantly, we want a call to action. We, we want people to take, and I've said this a couple of times in this talk, take what they've learned in the art museum and apply it to their daily lives. So we often end um, with reflection questions. Um, and one of the social scientists that I work with a lot calls our, 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 it an empathy muscle, and you have to exercise your muscles. Um, you constantly, through different activities, whether it's the art museum or going out and meeting a lot of different people in your life, whatever it is, but what can you do to flex your empathy muscles? So we ask people who participate on our tours, what's one thing you learned today that will help you continue to exercise your empathy muscle? What ex action will you take? What act of kindness will you do for someone today? So really trying to leave people um, with the intent that um, they're going to do something with what they've learned. And then of course we would end with um, kind of another mindfulness activity to get people centered again and grounded and ready to go on with their day. And um, uh, thank you so much. I know I wanted to, I kind of rushed through a little bit but I wanted to make sure I had enough time for questions. So um, I'm quit sharing right now and open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Carlene. And um, now we can start asking you lots of things. Um, as I said, we are in a small group, so I think it should be quite easy to, to address you. Um, 
If you want, you can raise your hand and or you can simply just unmute your microphone and, and speak. I actually, I always have questions. <laughs> good, good. I love questions. <laughs> Margarita knows. I actually have, it's two, it's two questions, but I think they're connected. Uh, one thing is, um, does it happen that sometimes people react oddly to this experience, meaning that they actually can't engage with some, uh, I don't know, uh, happily with the, these exercises of being confronted with something? So it, it, I don't know. I don't know if it happens. And the second thing is, if someone does this sort of um, tours that you do and engages with this experience and, and, and exercises, how likely they are to come back? Have you seen an increase of you know the same audience returning because they something happens to them during these processes and helps them to return to the, the same museum or another? Uh, they're two different, but I think they might be connected. <laughs> yes. So I think you're right. I think I think part I think having empathy for our audiences, especially adult audiences, I will say that are maybe not as used to doing activities and maybe not as used to sharing their emotions or thinking, really trying to set the stage that this is what this experience is going to be like. So they know what they're getting into, like the empathy lab, um, the virtual empathy lab that I said that we did um, a couple of weeks ago, we were really clear, you know, you need to be vulnerable, you're going to be put into breakout groups, you're going to be sharing. So really empathizing, but letting people know that ahead of time. And we have seen people be resistant to the activities. We've worked with a lot of um, corporate groups that have come on empathy tours, but you know, once they get into it, they really enjoy it. So they, I think, you know, just kind of going with it for a little while, most people really end up having um, a good time. And with, especially with corporate groups, they get to know their colleagues so much better and they build these connections. Um, and I think we, we kind of got interrupted by COVID with these programs. So I can't say if we have a lot of returning visitors, but I think, I think we will. Um, but I can't answer that right now just because, you know, we had to kind of disrupt what our programming. Um, but I'm hoping to, but that's a really good thing to be for me to be thinking about and looking for repeat visitors and, and program attendees. Thank you so much. <laughs> sure. Thank you for that. Can I just come in? Um, sure. I just wonder if you can tell me a little bit more about how um, the kind of training you supply to you do for your staff. Um, who are delivering the, the workshops and what kind of background some of these people might have? Yeah, great question. So um, currently we have um, some of our education staff who have a lot of experience um, in dialogical teaching. Uh, we have a lot of our volunteer gu tour guides that are also um, practicing in these tours. And we've also hired some teaching artists um, that are participating in this too. We really... Um, wanted to have a diverse group of people leading these tours so people could see themselves reflected at the museum. And I will say like a lot of um, museums, our volunteer core tends to be older and very white um, and our audiences not necessarily. So we're really trying to have a broad group, a very broad diverse group of people, um, but we're really training them in um, dialogical teaching strategies, a lot of, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with visual thinking strategies. So a lot of our teams have been, in, you know, engaged with that. That's really kind of a learner centered um, approach. And so, a lot, um, and then we do, we do a special training for the empathy tour leaders walking them through the tour, giving them the scientific background. Um, and we've done a lot of prototyping and experimenting and finding out what works. But um, so it's kind of people that already have a lot of um, gallery teaching skills and knowledge, but kind of re and just kind of teaching them a new approach. And I think we do a lot of um, activities and reflections in this that aren't part of other tours. So um, just kind of teaching them new skills and strategies within these tours. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that was something I was also particularly interested in and also within this context of, of the charter project where we look at skills and upskilling and reskilling, uh, thinking that this kind of training would you know, be necessary in a museum is also, is also very interesting for us. Jenny Seung uh, added a comment in the chat. I don't know if you want to um, put it in, in words, Jenny. Thanks, Margarita. Um, and thank you, Carly. No, I, I'm in agreement with the program, um, but it does take a very special skill set um, when dealing with empathy and mindfulness. And mm -hmm. I believe this whole horrible experience that we're all going through will bring up a lot of things, particularly in public spaces. And just to be mindful of that as well. Um, um, yes, are absolutely, so Jennifer. That's a really, really good point. And we have not, um, you know, come back. To, we're not doing tours in the museum yet. So I think you're right. I think um, being really mindful and practicing empathy as practitioners um, and really thinking about um, people sharing, it could be, you know, traumatizing for people. So really being mindful of that. Um, I think that's a really good point. I'm going to make a note of that and just really think about how we might be able to do some trauma informed training. We've talked a lot about this. Um, pre-COVID, but now post, well, almost post-COVID, um, I think that's something really to, uh, to focus on. I know a lot of um, educators in the United States have been focusing on trauma-informed teaching practices, anti-racist teaching practices. So I think that's um, something that we should really think about and prepare our guides for. So thank you for bringing that up, Jennifer. Thanks, Carly. No, I was actually bringing it up myself as well just to take note for myself <laughs> yes no it's we good... are vulnerable ourselves as, as museum practitioners um, True. So it's a it's a place where I, I understand in the recovery that government will see museums as places for supporting recovery yes of some kind that mm -hmm. museums are places of sanctuary but yet the people in them working in them are also impacted by COVID-19 so it's just, and I mean, I love the idea of mindfulness and empathy. They're fantastic. It's just, I guess, I suppose I do feel vulnerable um, by going back in and re-engaging. So it's just, it's just something that's sprung to mind, but I think it's a fantastic project or program. Well, thank you. And I think you bring up a really good point. Uh, we, we keep talking about empathy for our visitors. We need to also think empathetically about our staff and our, and our, our guides. Um, and what you know, we have all gone through during these last 16 months um, and really um, thinking about self-care and um, taking care of our, our staff and their wellness um, is really, really important. So thank you for sharing that. German, please. Yeah, thank you, Caroline. I have a question. Do, do you bring any of these activities in order to practice empathy outside of the museum as well, in order to engage with the community or with the surrounding? That's a great question. We had started doing a little bit of that, especially with one of our creative aging programs um, for older adults with its art making, um, working with the teaching artists, looking at artworks. So we had started doing that. Um, but with COVID, it kind of put an end to those in person. Um, but we, we, you know, we do it doing a little bit in the virtual world. But I'd love to see once we are back at the museum and it's safe to go out into communities. Um, we absolutely want to think about engaging, like meeting people where they are. You know, that's that's modeling empathy too, right? So um, I think that's a great idea. We've got a lot of really strong community partnerships. Um, and really will probably be thinking about how we can kind of take it outside the museum walls, not just virtually, but in person as well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, if it's fine, I, I actually also had a question. Um, sure, of course. <laughs> okay. um, I'm just wondering, um, during these tours, if you are using a variety of different art forms, like if, um, you know, if there's paintings and sculptures and film, if you feel that um, there's one or another that um, 
seems to generate more of this empathetic response and like willingness to be vulnerable or if you think it just flat out completely varies person to person just wondering well i think it can vary person to person but we have noticed a lot and i didn't show a lot of sculpture on here um but we do really thinking about embodiment and that in you know 3d we have noticed a lot more people um really kind of maybe um having experiences with sculpture because they are 3D. Um, so that's a really good point. I will say that this whole um, initiative has made us look at our collection differently. We realize how stern and noble so many of our portraits are and they, they don't have a lot of emotions because you know that was kind of the intent of why they were created to show someone's social class or a hierarchy. Um, and so we're really um, you know, looking at our collection differently and Another thing about being virtual, like the experience you all did with those portraits, I could have never done that in the museum because they're all in different galleries. We do have one gallery that's all um, portraits. And so that's where we do that activity, but there's not the diversity of portraits in there that we would ultimately like. So I'm, I'm trying to get our curators to give me a gallery so I could have like an, an empathy space where we could do a lot of these practices. I don't know how realistic that is. But um, yeah, I think um, people, they really all different media of art form. I think it depends on what the artwork is, how like emotionally evocative it is, and then also depending on the person. But I have, like I said, noticed sculpture really does resonate with people. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Thank you. Elise, <laughs> mm -hmm. well, please. Yes. I'm just, I'm finding this really, really, really interesting, very curious. It's not at all my area, but uh, lots of questions popping up. Do you, do you see, there are clusters in demographics that react better to your experience? You, you mentioned that uh, maybe corporate people or older people are not so used to do exercises and these activities like a young, the youngsters are maybe, but do you, do you see, is there a pattern of age or I don't know, whatever? If there are clusters that are very difficult to crack, I would say, and others that are very welcome. This is a question. Another one, I'm thinking about audiences and, and, and then especially I'm also thinking about how could this be a driver of in, engaging and more people coming to museums? You, you understand as, a, as a, a way of opening museums again to different audiences, which I would say that for instance, I'm coming from Portugal would be really key. So um, do you see a pattern of people more open to these experiences and, and this sort of programs and tours? And <laughs> I will say just from um, our recent experience, um, it tends to be an older demographic of people. I mean, like for our empathy lab, it was a lot. I mean, and we also did it in, in a morning. So it might, the time. So I think it's experimenting, but we know that Older people tend to be more empathic than younger people. Um, and they also, I think, in, especially in this COVID age, are looking for social connection. So I love your idea of how could we use this as an opportunity to invite people to come back to museums and connect with new people in different ways. Um, so I think that's a really, really uh, strong thing to think about. Um, we might, I might have to talk to our marketing team about that, but I think it would be a great way to not just have a, a passive experience, but to join a group and really have an engaging dialogue around artwork and to meet new people and learn new things. So I love that idea. Yeah. I, I'm just saying this because I saw this uh, in the first, well, you know, the first reopening of things we had last year is that um, and in Portugal, it is a problem for to take people to, to museums. If you go to a museum, you will find either the students, the tourists, or those old people who went to museums all their lives and, and usually are uh, educated, color, scholar people who actually has done have done that as a routine on their lives. And after all of these we've gone through, like um, Larry says and Jennifer, would this be a good, uh, a, a, I don't know, a good idea of how can we use this, uh, this sort of thinking to engage with people and re really welcome people to museums as, um, as a place where they can unlock all of these social fears that most people will have now, this problem of engaging, the post-trauma, all of that. So <laughs> I was wondering if that could be an, a, a good way, because it is 
this program, it is to crack a bit of the difficulty of people of engaging, I would say. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so this could be, a, could be a tool, just, well, yeah. very interesting. <laughs> Thank you so much. More questions or remarks, ideas to, to share with Carlene? I, I have a question, if that's okay. Hi. Sure. Um, thanks very much, Carlene. I also find it very interesting. I just have a very practical question, um, i.e., do you run these empathy tours and empathy labs open to general public? So you explain what is to be expected and then people join in or is it only for a class or for a corporate group or for because i would be interested in knowing how if it is open for general public how do you manage it and how do you actually manage because i i like unlike um, Alicia, i would be slightly afraid of these therapeutic expectations of people to have towards such a tour because i think you would have to have an art therapist who is able to run professionally who can deal with any sort of trauma and um, if that happens I would also imagine that there would have to be very strict kind of guidelines of what you can and can't share and what you can and cannot comment on and so on and I don't know if unexperienced people commenting on each other's experience is a good idea so to speak <laughs> you know it's completely different when it's a it's a guide who's been trained to deal with these things um, tactfully mm -hmm. and kind of if there is any tension of uh, or any trauma to know how to deal and move on with it and it's completely different if unexperienced participants are commenting on each other's you know experiences so how how do you how do you manage this that's a great question i would say with the empathy tours we have marketed we've done those with school groups and with corporate groups so we haven't opened those up to the public um, for the empathy lab that we recently did that was open to the public. And like I said, we were very explicit about, you know, you're, you're going to share, it's interactive. But I think uh, you bring up some um, really good um, points that we aren't therapists. We might not, we might uncover something that we don't know how to um, handle or how to um, work with that person. So I think, um, again, it's trying to look to outside experts. And I think maybe in this after COVID, there's going to be a lot more of that showing up than maybe pre-COVID. So um, I, I, we do work with art therapists. Um, they're not necessarily on the tours, but I think maybe um, you've given me an idea too, really thinking about that trauma-informed teaching practices. Maybe we do need to work with some art therapists and, and come up with some different ways that our educators and guides um, might be able to deal with and handle situations um, that arise like that. So got a lot of, I don't have a lot of answers for that, but that's really um, useful information for me to think about. Um, so thank you, Justina. No, thank you. And you know, we're, we're also kind of considering, for example, doing something like that for teens specifically, because I think um, teenagers would have been affected very, yeah. much by the current situation and we have been talking about well-being amongst you know younger audiences and you know it's such a great age of discovery and a lot of that is done through being with others for teenagers they discover themselves and discover themselves in their communities so to speak which has been taken mm -hmm. away from them so right. i would be very interested right. also you know how you do your empathy labs um, but I might just look at your website and see what's there. <laughs> yeah, you. I love your idea, though. I'd love to maybe do a teen empathy lab. I think that would be a great idea. You're right. I mean, teens have been very impacted having to go to school from home and not being able to socialize. So I think that's a, a great idea. Thank you. Any other question or comment? Uh, I have a question. Um, Carlin, uh, regarding uh, the digital tools, uh, are you using digital tools uh, during your uh, activities, especially with teens? Because I understand uh, it's better do not use digital technologies or mobile to create empathy also because we know that uh, the young generation use uh, technologies and technologies that do not create empathy, but uh, uh, people are uh, alone. 
But um, are you using, or uh, uh, of course, uh, are you using after the visit uh, to create a digital storytelling or impression? What kind, which kind of tools are, uh, are you using or not using? So I would say we're not using any digital tools currently. It's you know more um, sketching, journaling, different uh, dialogical activities within the tour itself. I will say that we have developed um, an empathy quiz with the University of California, Berkeley, and it's on an iPad, but it's a pre and a post. Um, it's really about um, kind of test. I hate to say the word test, but we're trying to you know have some quantitative measurements. Um, and it's really about um, uh, identifying other people's emotions um, and perspective taking. So it's different, it, but it's kind of a fun quiz that you do before the tour and then after the tour, but that's the only digital component so far. But we are also looking very much more for qualitative data. So we are gonna be asking questions. So I like your idea of maybe digital storytelling as a, and a pl place for people who have experienced the tour to share their thoughts and responses. So I like that idea, but currently we're not, besides the quiz, we're not doing um, anything with digital. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Well, if not, and if I may, I have two very quick questions myself. One is if this philosophy has been embraced by your organization, by the museum itself, is it in your mission? Are you becoming, I've read something about the empathetic museum in the, in the US, there's also a website. Are you en route to, to become an empathetic or you are already maybe? How much has this been built into the institutional fabric of your organization? Uh, and the other question is about, uh, you mentioned that you're working with community, or you have established a community of practice or community of practice, communities of practice. Um, is there some, with universities, is there somewhere uh, where you have distilled this knowledge and this experience? Is there something written, uh, a report, a manual, whatever that we could share now or, or in the future? Thank you. Great question. So I will say that this started off as a research project. You know, how can the visual engagement with the visual arts foster empathy? But it got gained such momentum at our institution that I would say we're we're on our way to being an empathetic museum. Um, we really are very visitor centered, so we're con you know really thinking about our the perspectives and motivations of our visitors, how we can help them feel a sense of belonging and welcoming when they come to the museum. How can we help them see themselves, whether it's in the staff or the artwork at the museum and um, really thinking about wellness for staff. I mean, I think like we talked about earlier. So we're thinking about that very much. We're thinking about it in our the selection of exhibitions, in the curation and design and interpretation of exhibitions, and then also in our programs. So it really has become an institutional initiative. And um, part of the grant that we received to do the research um, is funding a toolkit. Um, so we will have tools, strategies, once we can actually do our research um, and we will share, it'll be a digital free to anyone to use. And then we'll also have kind of a convening to share this. And it, initially it was gonna be in person, but now we've seen, um, like I said, we can get a, a worldwide audience um, so we're going to probably be doing a virtual convening to share our research, to have, you know, and share the practices and strategies that we've developed um, probably in the spring of late 2023. Um, so um, look for that. That will be coming. Um, we're, we really want to share and we want to really anybody who has ideas that can help us move this work forward. We're very interested in collaboration. We believe in multiple perspectives and areas of expertise. So um, I've learned so much from all of you today. So um, please feel free anytime to reach out. Um, I would love to have further discussion with you and really appreciate your insights and ideas. Thank you so much, Carlene. And we want to be kept in the loop. So we will okay, look out good, for- Okay, good, good. Excellent. <laughs> thank you so much. I think we can close this webinar. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Carlene Gardner, first of all, very much for your time. And um, Paolo and Herman for uh, their presentations. And of course, Liz from the NEMO office. Liz, 
it's time to show yourself and say goodbye. <laughs> Thank you very much for your support behind the scenes and a good afternoon and morning to, to all of us again. Yes. Thank goodbye. you all so much. It was a pleasure. Goodbye.